Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Deve Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschacha Desatarine Vancha kaupata rupyasya kripa sindhu bhayevacha patita nam pavan ebyo vaishna bibyo namo namaha jaya shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shri vasadi gor bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we welcome everyone back to our study of this chapter number 20, Description of Autumn from the 10th Canto Srimad Bhagavatam which we're studying as part of the Bhaktivedanta course. So yesterday I wanted to show you the illustration which is presented for this one text which we studied yesterday. We were talking about how sometimes the sage may speak and sometimes they don't. Written here, number 33. This is 33 in the light of the Bhagavad, but in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's text number, I think, 37. There are waterfalls, oh, the wording is also different, anyway, but it, it's a, the same kind of text, just different wording. There are waterfalls flowing from the hills of the forest, but sometimes water does not flow from them. So the waterfalls are not like ordinary rainfall. They are compared to great reformers who speak or do not speak as the time requires. So we were speaking how, we were discussing yesterday, it was very nice, uh, how sometimes a person may speak and sometimes he will be quiet. And the example is given here in nature that in the autumn season, sometimes the water will be there from the waterfalls and sometimes it's not. So the same way sometimes these great sages, they may speak, they're, they have a, they're fully realized, they're fully enlightened, but they, they will consider the circumstances and they will consider what do you think particularly when they before they speak, they're going to consider what? Be, what, what do you think is going to influence the great sage in making decision whether or not to speak? Also. The question comes up, what is he going to speak about? Is he just going to speak about the science of the soul or is he going to speak about prema bhakti? What's going to be the main consideration there? The specific circumstances? Yes, what circumstances? What's going to if make... The, if the circumstances congenial, if people are uh, eager to hear, and then uh, he would reveal it. Uh-huh. Anybody else like to add something there? Eagerness to hear. Yeah, audience should be enthusiastic. That's important. Certainly that eagerness to hear, mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto, first chapter, the sages from Naimasharanya were eager to hear Sutta Goswami. May I speak? Yes. Then as we see in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna did not speak until Arjuna expressed his submission. So the student should be submissive for uh, a great soul, a spiritual master to speak. Well, that's, I would say that's a special circumstance, you know. It, it's not necessarily true that the, the one has to be 
fully submissive or surrendered. We, we don't, for example, when we look at Maharaj Rahugan and Jabbarat, Rahugan was not really submissive to Jadbarat, but Jadbarat spoke. You know, Maharaj Rahugan was actually chastising Jadbarat. He said, have you beaten? Yeah, so, so there was some, there is, seems to be some special situations. Sometimes it may be like that, that it should be submissive, certainly. Arjuna had requested Krishna to become his uh, guru and to guide him. He wanted instruction from him. So he should, he should show submissiveness, but it may, that submissiveness may not always be there. Yes? Maybe if it is beneficial for the people to hear, then the sadhu speak. Yes, should be beneficial for them. I think also you have to consider the, their qualification to hear. And you know, what exactly are you going to explain to them based on their qualification? You know, neophyte people or you know, common people, we're not going to speak to them about bhava and prema bhakti. We have to speak on a, on a a more general platform, knowledge of the difference between the body and the soul will be much more appropriate for the common people. Uh, Maharaj, it may be that the messenger himself is uh, under orders from a superior, let's say for example, either God or his representatives, to spread the message of God. So that might be another inspiration for him to try to spread the message according to the audience, of course. Mm, yes, in some circumstances, the, the, the order is definitely the order is there, but at the same time, we have to be somewhat selective. And we, we see, anyway, we see, for example, in you know, Narada Muni going to people, what was it? Uh, Chitraketu, Chitraketu initially wanted a son, and so Narada and Angira came and, and they gave him some sweet rice and said, you give this to your, your queen, you get a son. They didn't preach to him. They waited until he was, until, you know, the son had died and then, yes. then they came to preach. They waited for the appropriate situation where the king was more receptive to hearing them. We see, however, Nar Narada Muni is preaching to the hunter, M Mragari the hunter. The Narada Muni saw the hunter doing so many atrocities, trapping the animals and half killing them in a very cruel manner. And Narada Muni enlightened him about spiritual knowledge and convinced him to take to the path of devotion. So that was special. And we had the, also uh, the example, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. The Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sat for seven days and listened without questioning. And it was only when Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya began to get agitated and frustrated that there's no questions, why don't you ask something, you don't understand. Then only Lord Chaitanya spoke. So he waited for the appropriate situation when he could deliver transcendental knowledge. So there has to be that mood anyway, that the mercy, to give mercy to others. That, but it's going to depend on, on the, the speaker also. The speaker has to feel the, the inspiration to actually preach to that particular person. Prahlad Maharaj preached to the sons of all the demons in the Gurukula. He considered, you know, these children in the Gurukula that they were good candidates for devotional service. They were wasting their time in so many foolish ways and he preached to them about devotional service. And so it, it's, it's not 
so clear what particular situation we should preach, when we should preach and when we shouldn't. It's, it really depends a lot on the, the Lord in the heart, the, the inspiration we get from the heart, Krishna guiding us and empowering us and giving us that particular inspiration to really make efforts to deliver. Sometimes we do preach. I saw Prabhupada preach to one, one young man and the man was not accepting anything. And Prabhupada kept preaching and preaching. And why was Prabhupada preaching? Because he was teaching the devotees that we were all sitting, sitting listening to Prabhupada and we were hearing Prabhupada give so many examples. The young man wasn't really submissive and he wasn't accepting. But Prabhupada kept preaching. Why? Because he was teaching us. He was showing us, letting us hear how to present the philosophy and what examples we could use in preaching. And, and interesting enough, later on, Prabhupada came back, he'd gone out for a walk, he came back and he found the man was in the temple room and he was in the temple room dancing and Prabhupada said, you see, he said, I talked to him for so long, didn't make any impression, but now he's in the kirtan chanting and dancing. He said, this is Lord Chaitanya's mercy. This is the power of Sankirtan, that it gets everyone up to the transcendental level. Okay, uh, Okay, we're going to go on. Here's the text which we're going to go on today. Here's the illustration from text number, I think it's 37. Oh no, this is the wrong one. <laughs> I've got the wrong one, it should be the other one. Mm. Still got the same one, Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna goes back and forward. It should be this one then. Ah. Having some difficulty here to get this picture. Okay, I don't know what's happening, it's not opening. Doesn't matter, we won't show the picture, we'll just go to the text. Okay, can everyone see the text for the light of, for the Srimad Bhagavatam? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, good. So we're on text number 37. The fish swimming in the increasingly shallow water did not at all understand that the water was diminishing. Just as foolish family men cannot see how the time they have left to live is diminishing with every passing day. So we're hearing about the autumn season. You will remember some of the descriptions of autumn how it cloudless sky and the sun is very warm. What about the wind? Is there any wind in autumn? The main thing, the wind is not harsh. In the rainy season it can be very strong and harsh, but in the autumn season the wind is not harsh. So cloudless sky, clear water, remember the water's clear and lotus flowers are growing there and 
every the water settled down because no rain. So this is pretty much the description of autumn. So after the rainy season, the water gradually goes down. But stupid fish, not understanding that, the, not understanding this, thus they are often stranded on the lake shores and river banks. Similarly, those infatuated with family life. And so, Sukadeva Goswami is telling us about, the, he's giving this example, the, the fish are in the water, but the water's becoming shallower and shallower, and they're going to get stuck. They're going to find themselves with no water at all. And, but then when that happens, they'll die. And somebody will come along and, and take them maybe and they'll eat them or something. Maybe the, 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 the cat will come or something and cats eat fish. So it's a very precarious situation. And similarly, family life can also be a very precarious situation. We, we don't see the, the problems and the difficulty we're not preparing for the future. Everyone has to be properly trained. We said, and the life begins with the brahmacharya life, and then we enter into grihastha life, understanding that grihastha life is a, a part of the, the life. It's not the complete. It's not that we have to remain in grihastha life till the end of life, but we go on into vanaprastha. And that helps, to, helps us to prepare for the next life. So Grihastha life can be a preparation for that, for going into Vernaprastha life. Sometimes we see if the, the young man hasn't had experience of family life, then he, he becomes, you know, he's not able to properly absorb himself in the spiritual practice because his mind is so drawn to family life. It's like part, a part of life. It's a part of the culture. Most people in the world are family people. They're married people. The mass, vast majority of people are in family life. And if somebody doesn't have a wife, and doesn't, don't, they don't have children, then they feel, as you, you know, they can feel uncomfortable, they can feel lonely. And we see people often go into family life Recently, even we had we had one devotee. He was in old age, and he went into family life. He was already almost like seventy years of age, and he decided to get married. And he had been a very active preacher for many years, but somehow he wasn't settled, and he gave it up and he went into went back. Sometimes you have to go back in order to go forward. It's unfortunate, but sometimes these things happen. So we have to be careful. That's the point. Don't try to rush into transcendence, right? Premature transcendence. Everyone agree? Now, people in family life, they may complain, oh, it's so difficult, oh, it's so trouble. But it's trouble everywhere in the material world. Everywhere is trouble. Okay, number 38 is similar. It's also talking about fish and their plight in shallow water. Anyway, we'll read it. Just as a miserly, poverty-stricken person, overly absorbed in family life, suffers, because he cannot control his senses. The fish swimming in the shallow water had to suffer the heat of the autumn sun. So again, the example is fish and the water is getting shallow and they're suffering. Very difficult. And it's, this is similar to people absorbed in family life particularly because they cannot control their senses. And so because they don't control their senses, they may have several children. And the bigger, the, you know, they have a big family and it, sometimes it can be difficult to support the family. It's a lot of work to maintain a large family. 
although it's very nice, it's very good to have a large family and bring them all up in Krishna consciousness, but it's not, it's not such an easy thing unless one is well situated, if he you know, has a good job and he has good income, then it's not so bad. But otherwise it can be very difficult. And nowadays we don't find it so common. People in general, and it's well, difficult for them to have m m so many children. But it's actually very nice. There was that one lady, uh, Krishna Nandini Maharaji, and she had nine children, was it? Nine or ten children. And she was a very good devotee. And she wrote books about how to take care of children, how to bring up children, which was very nice and very helpful for devotees. So in the purport, they talk about ignorance is bliss, that the fish are in ignorance, and they're thinking, oh, it's, all, it's okay, everything's all right, but they don't see the danger. They're not aware of the difficulties which are coming. Similarly, an attached family man may consider his ignorance as, as of his ignorance of spiritual life to be blissful. But still, there's a lot of disturbance, uncontrolled senses, and so many anxieties. One of the difficulties is keeping people happy. And when you have a family, it's difficult to keep everyone happy. Although the man may work, be working very hard and trying his best to please everyone, it's very difficult to satisfy everyone. And so it, we say you should be satisfied. This applies to everyone in the family, not just to the father. Everyone should be satisfied. The wife should be satisfied. She shouldn't always be complaining to the husband. And the children should be satisfied also. They shouldn't always be complaining to their parents. Oh, I need this. I have to get that. You should get me this. You know, they can, children can put a lot of pressure onto their parents, make life very difficult. So it's very difficult to satisfy people. This is a problem. Actually, what we should be doing is satisfy Krishna. <laughs> very hard to satisfy everyone, but if you can satisfy Krishna, that's the best thing. Try to please Krishna and the spiritual master also. Everyone agree? Any comments? Okay, we'll go ahead. Number 39 in the, in the chapter 20, Bhagavatam. Gradually, the different areas of land give up their muddy condition and the plants grew past their unripe stage in the same way that sober, the, the, in the same way that sober sages give up egotism and possessiveness. These are based on things different from the real self namely the material body and its byproducts. So, the example is given here, nice example. We know in autumn season there's no rain, so the muddy condition is gradually reducing and the ground is becoming harder and solid, not so muddy anymore. And the plants are growing up and they've come to the they're, they're, they're becoming ready for harvesting. And this is compared to the sober sages who give up these two qualities, egotism and possessiveness. So possessiveness, that will be an outward attribute. Possessiveness, just like we have a, you know, the, the man may have a son or the wife has a son, his wife has a son, they have a son. So they're very, they're very proud. This is our son. This is our son. Very attached. They identify our son, our house, like this, the home also. So this kind of, this is possess, possessiveness is based on the outward objects. Egotism is more internal. The, the mood of egotism, the sense of I 
I am the doer, I did this, and, you know, that kind of mood which is there within people. So one is outward and the other is inward. But the sober sage will give up both of these kind of qualities because he's understood that he's not the material body and he has nothing to do with the byproducts of the body. The byproducts of the body are mentioned, the children, the home, the wealth. And this is all the byproducts. So he's detached from all that. He's reached that stage of maturity in his uh, path of transcendence. He's able to give up that identification with the body and the attachment to the material objects. And it's compared to nature, to just like the land drying up and the plants growing. We'll go ahead, text number 40. With the arrival of autumn, the ocean and the lakes become silent, their waters still, just like a sage who has desisted from all material activities and given up his recitation of Vedic mantras. Uh, with the arrival of autumn. And so again, the end of the rainy season, we're into autumn and it's warm, the cloudless sky, everything is peaceful and the ocean and the lakes also are silent. Their water still, right? The water is actually pure. Not like in the rainy season where all the mud comes up from the bottom, but the, everything, the water is pure and peaceful and it's compared to the sage who has stopped all his material activities and he gives up his recitation of Vedic mantras. Why would he give up reciting Ved Vedic mantras, do you think? Well, doesn't he get purification by reciting Vedic mantras? You know, Vedic mantras, the Vedas, the Vedas are, you know, it's coming from the Lord Himself, right? The Vedas, Tenhe Brahma Ridai Shahadikabhaye, the Vedic knowledge was imparted into the heart, into the heart of Brahma. And so the Vedas are some way, and you know, the Vedic mantras, you could say, you know, it's uh, certainly auspicious sounds. Maras, can I speak? Yes, please do. Maras, in case of if they are jnanis, then jnan they have to give up at a particular point of time. What? They have to give up the jnan at a particular point of time before entering Brahman. Ah. In that case, they have to give up the Vedic mantras. Krishna okay. writes it as a Gyanam Chamai Sannaset in the 11th canto, 11.19.1. Oh. So in that case, they have to give up the Vedic mantras before entering in Brahman. Hmm. Give up the Vedic mantras before entering into Brahman. And so what's he, what's he going to do when he enters into Brahman? You go, uh, you Brahman go. is cannot. It doesn't have any activity there. Oh, no activity. Is that, is that secure? Hare Not secure. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You have to fall down again. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Manaji? Uh, here, I think in the purport it mentions the ordinary Vedic mantras which actually promotes dharma after karma. And uh, Krishna also, I mean, here the sage has using those Vedic mantras for uh, fulfilling the personal desires. And uh, Krishna also says in Bhagavad Gita that uh, one should not get attracted to this flowery languages of the Vedas, which gives all these three. One should transcend these things. So in that sense, he start vibrating the, I mean, he started uh, reciting the transcendental glories and means, uh, which is, uh, I mean, Krishna also says in the Bhagavad Gita that what Karjira should transcend. 
uh, in that sense he gives up reciting the vedic mantras which is ordinary and what will he recite he'll, he'll start reciting uh, those which actually i mean uh, the which are um, the vedic mantras are like bringing the people from three modes right one can use yeah, i mean uh, removing the thorn with the same thorn <laughs> remove the so thorn from the with... three modes we use the transcendental uh, we should take up some other process which is beyond the three modes in that sense started reciting um, the transcendental glories so what would you recite we take shelter of shrimad bhagavatam maharaj yes Huh? Yes, Srimad Bhagavatam, right. That's a ripen that's a ripen fruit of the Vedas. Yes, very, very good. Yes. Maria. Huh? This Prabhu? Yes, So it mentions here Vedic mantras for uh, promotion, right? So material promotion some people may re recite vedic mantras for material promotion that's going to be like the karma yogi you know he wants to maybe go to heaven and enjoy there and then, then you've got the yogi he wants the mystic powers he may also go to the higher planets to enjoy mystic powers and yoga cities and then the impersonalist the jnani he will want to enter into the impersonal brahman so they could all be reciting Vedic mantras. One recites ordinary Vedic mantras for these things. They, they would all be reciting Vedic mantras. But when he gets free of personal desire, like these people, the karma yogi, the jnana yogi, and the, the mystic yogi, they all have material desires. Bhukti mukti siddhikami sakali ashanta. So they're not completely free of personal desires. But when they get free of personal desire, then they'll come to the higher stage and they'll just simply chant the glories of the Supreme Lord exclusively. As Mariji nicely described there, these other things, this is the flowery regions of the Vedas. So Krishna gives the example about the flowers because flowers are very temporary. They look good for a while, a little while, but they, they don't last long. They soon wither and dry up. And so that's the problem with the material benedictions which you're getting. It won't last for very long. But if you go to the transcendental platform, if you come to the transcendental stage, then you can get eternal life. You can go to the spiritual world. So, the sage can give up chanting Vedic mantras. It's just simply for material, materialistic-minded people. Okay, going ahead, 41. In the same way that the practitioners of yoga bring their senses under strict control to check their consciousness from flowing out through the agitated senses, the farmers erected strong mud banks to keep the water within their rice fields from draining out. All right, so this is an interesting analogy here. The muddy, the, uh, the farmers in the fields, of course, they have these, they build these walls of mud to keep the water within because they know in autumn there's not going to be much rain. The rainy season's over and well, we see in India generally that a lot of the places they, they can only get one harvest. They can only plant rice once in the year. They plant once in the year and that's, you know, at the time when, the, when it rains. The rest of the time there'll be no rain. So how can they grow anything? No water. But what they d can do is when it rains, they can keep the water within the fields. And so they have mud banks to keep the water within the rice fields and stop it from draining out. 
So this is compared to the practitioners of yoga. How, how are the yogis going to do this? What are they going to do to cultivate, the, to keep the, the to keep their uh, power? Right? Any of you know? According to purport, they control the senses so that uh, unnecessary energy is not drained out in uh, using senses for sense gratification. So, there's a, there's a process to do that in yoga. Do you know the process? Using it for a higher purpose, uh, getting higher taste. Well, no, there's a mechanical process by which one can keep the power, keep this power and restrain it. Stop it from running out, going out. As you said, of course, you have to go away from sense gratification. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to give up sense gratification? You still have material desires. Control the breath, Maharaj. Huh? Control the breath. Yes. Because the life air is... That's, that's a possibility, right? That's one way, that's one mechanical process, Con control the breath, right? Maharaj, there are different chakras in the body, so the energy is preserved in those chakras. Okay, okay. So, Prab first of all, Prabhu is talking about controlling the breath, so that, that's part of what process in yoga? What kind of yoga? Pranayama. Pranayama. Pranayama, yeah, but pranayama is step one step in what what kind of yoga? Hatha yoga. No, no, astanga. Yeah, astanga, astanga yes. yoga. Astanga yoga, right? Yam niyam asan pranayam, right? Yam niyam asan pranayam. It's the fourth step in yoga, in breath control. You know, sometimes. You know, if you have difficulty controlling anger, it's sometimes a good idea to practice that kind of thing, breath control, you know. Before you get too angry and start yelling and screaming and throwing things and doing bad, saying bad things, better to just uh, sometimes do some pranayama. <laughs> go away and just go and do some pranayama, control your breath, get yourself under control. Hmm. So. Breath control is a mechanical process by which we can control the mind. And anger management is often a big challenge for people. Get, helping people to overcome their anger, sometimes it's very dangerous. People get so angry sometimes, they, they do things which they regret. So it's important to be able to control your anger, and one way which you can do it is by breath control. People need to practice, you know, in, in previous ages everyone knew how to do that, pranayama. It was common practice. People were, everyone was doing it. Kali Yuga people, not so many people know. Of course that one man, uh, that one, uh, I won't say his name, but you know, he's got a very big movement. They, they teach that pranayama everywhere. And they, they get a lot of people to their Mayavadi, impersonal things. He actually, they attract their people by pranayama, by teaching pranayama. Which is, Prabhupada writes in the, in the Bhagavatam how pranayama can prolong life. It can help people to live longer time, but of course that's not the goal. What is the, why should we want to have a long life? The trees also live a long time. What's the point of a long life? Better a moment of full consciousness than a long life like a tree. And Prabhupada, who, which examples does Prabhupada give? Who was in this world only a short time but made great contributions? Satanya. Yes. How many years was he here? Forty. Forty-eight. 
And who else? You don't know this purport? This is a famous purport. Prabhupada said, better a moment of full consciousness than a lifetime like a tree. And he says, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in this world for 48 years. And then Shankaracharya. How many years was Shankaracharya in the world? 30. 32. 32, right. 32 years. But great contribution. Prabhupada appreciates the contribution. Shankaracharya, yeah, great contribution. Right. What did he do? What did Shankaracharya do? Vedas Maharaj? Yes, he brought back the Vedas. Mm. Drove away Buddhism? Huh? Large extent. What? Drove away Buddhism. Drove out, the, drove out Buddhism, right. He generally, he's got the credit for doing that, for defeating Buddhism, driving Buddhism out of India. Yes. And literary contribution also. He wrote his uh, Jagannath Astika <laughs> was there. Shankaracharya wrote a Jagannadastikam. Interesting enough. And so many commentaries, different scriptures, Bhagavad Gita and like that. Okay. And so, great contribution. Short life, but great contribution. So it's, it's not just a long life. You don't want that. The aim is to do something. So pranayama does help us to, you know, you, you can and helps get to, get better health. Helps you have some maybe health problems. It can help to give you better health and a longer life. But there's another process also which comes on, on a higher level of, pran, of pranayama af, after pranayama. That is pratyahara. Right? Yam, niyam, asan, pranayam, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Right? Astanga yoga. These are the eight stages. So, pratyahara is particularly mentioned by Prabhupada in his Light of the Bhagavad Purport. And he talks about the process of pratyahara for restraining the senses. That the yogi can restrain his senses by doing. The, the practicing the process of pratyahara, right? That pratyahara means instead of being absorbed in the external, you, you turn the consciousness within, withdrawing the senses. Instead of looking around you, you look within and contemplate within. That is pratyahara, restraining the senses. So, this is one way in which uh, the yogi can bring the senses under control and check the consciousness from flowing out through agitated senses. Yeah, just think how much we waste our energy in so many futile endeavours. We want to learn how to conserve. We, we talk about conserving energy, don't waste resources. So we ourselves, within our own human life, we're often very negligent. and We waste a lot of the uh, power of life which is in our body. And so contemplating uh, the object, just contemplating sense gratification takes away a lot of energy from the body. We want to practice this uh, breath control, maybe in pratyahara, uh, these things. Are, unless, of course, we, we may be very good in bhakti yoga, we can simply absorb ourselves in chanting the holy name. But not everybody's on that level, that they're able to just simply take shelter of the holy name. So we should understand there are some processes there which help us to come to the higher level. And these things are also Vedic, they're mentioned in the scriptures. Bhagavad Gita describes about the, 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 the process of yoga and meditation. So this is compared to the farmer. Uh, building the wall around the fields to keep the water from draining out. 
We don't want to let our energy drain out. We waste our energy in so many mundane, futile endeavors. If you look at what people do, how much, how they waste their human life. So Prabhupada says, in, or in the purport it says, unless one is able to control the senses and engage them in the transcendental loving service of Makunda, there is no possibility of salvation. All right, we'll go ahead, 42. The autumn moon relieved all creatures of the suffering caused by the sun's rays. Just as wisdom relieves a person of the misery caused by his identifying with his material body. And as Lord Makunda relieves Vrindavan's ladies of the distress caused by their separation from him. So there's no purport here in the, in the text. But in the light of the Bhagavad, Srila Prabhupada has given some purport on this text. And particularly he talks about the two different ways in which people can worship Lord Makunda, as he is described here. That we can worship Lord Krishna uh, either in Samboga or in Viraha. Meaning, we can, Samboga means directly, in direct connection with Krishna, meeting with Krishna, and directly worshipping him. Or in Varaha, that is the process of separation. And of course, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the followers of Lord Chaitanya, they recommend the process of worshipping Lord Krishna in the, that mood of Viraha in that mood of separation. Because feeling the separation of Lord Krishna, then one is, becomes more absorbed in Krishna. If we are directly serving Krishna, we won't be so absorbed. But when we feel the separation from Krishna, there will be more consciousness of Krishna. So this, this is of course the mood of the gopis. The mood of the gopis, all the gopis who are considered the greatest of all Krishna's devotees, they're simple cowherd ladies, but what is their position? They're the greatest devotees. And who are these ladies actually? In their previous life, there are different identities. The, the, in their previous life, you have some of the gopis were uh, the great sages from uh, in Dandakaranya forest, who had seen Lord Rama and they wanted to have an amorous relationship with him. But Lord Rama told them that, I'm sorry that I vowed only to have one wife in this Leela, but you come in my next incarnation and you can take birth in the families of the gopis of Braja and at that time we can arrange to satisfy all your desires. So the sages from Dandakaranya, they became a group of gopis. And then there's other sages, the personified Vedas. They also became a group of gopis. The Shruti Charanas, the personified Vedas, they wanted to understand more of the Lord's pastimes. And in order for them to do that, they had to take birth in the family of the cowherd ladies of Vrindavan. As just simply as the Shruti Charanas, they could not Get, they could not understand Krishna's pastimes. It wasn't until they took their birth in the families of the, the Vrindavasi people and take, take care of the cows, then they were actually able to join with Lord Krishna and take part in his pastimes. So those are two groups of uh, gopis. And just to show you, you know, these gopis, they're not ordinary ladies. Just like the cowherd boys, they're all great souls who perform pious activities over many lifetimes. In the same way, the gopis also were very, very special, enlightened ladies. Not that they were just simple village ladies, illiterate, didn't know anything, just collect cow dung. No, they were very, very enlightened 
devotees of Lord Krishna. So they were feeling separation from Krishna. They're given as an example. They, well, first of all, we're told about the moon relieving all creatures of their suffering caused by the sun's rays. In the daytime, in the autumn, the sun's rays are very hot. But then in the evening, when the moon comes up, then the moon is cooling and people feel relief. And then, so it's compared to just as wisdom relieves a person of the misery caused by his identifying with the material body. Wisdom helps us to get free of the misery caused by identifying with this material body. We should remember that. We often feel miserable simply because of our material bodies. But if we will under, if we will take advantage of transcendental knowledge, the wisdom, that will relieve us from all the, the anxieties and the depression and the bodily problems which are coming on us. So the material body, the cause of all of our problems, uh, but we can get relief from that by knowledge, by wisdom. And then the other example is about the gopis. Lord Makunda relieves Vrindavan's ladies of the distress caused by their separation from him. So the gopis, they worship Krishna so much, but in their separation from him, they felt great ang anguish, they felt great anxiety. It was very difficult for them to be separate from Lord Krishna. It was... That they were always in that fire of separation. So the, the fire of separation was put out by the, when Lord Krishna would return. Krishna would go out every day into the forest with the cows, and that, then the gopis would feel the separation, because the gopis can't go into the forest with Krishna in the daytime. The cowherd boys go, the gopas, and the gopis, they get Krishna in the night. But in the daytime, it's the cowherd boys who are with Krishna. And the gopis, they have to do their chores. They have to take care of the cows. They have to take care of the children. They have to clean the house. They have to do so many things. They have to churn the butter, milk the cows, all these things. And the cowherd boys, they're there with Krishna in the forest, playing with him. Okay, so that's 42. We'll go ahead, 43. Free of clouds and filled with clearly visible stars, the autumn sky shone brilliantly, just like the spiritual consciousness of one who has directly experienced the purport of the Vedic scriptures. The purport of the Vedic scriptures, what would that be? What is the purport of the Vedic scriptures? And can it be our Sambandha Gyan with Krishna? Yes, I think so, Prabhu. I would think that's part of it, yes. Anybody else? What would be a verse from the Bhagavad Gita? Yes. Vidant, yes. Yes. Krishna says, I think I think that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, I think Krishna, I'm in the hearts of all living entities. From me comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. But then he said, By all the Vedas I am to be known. Indeed, I am the author and I am the compiler of the Vedas. And so Lord Krishna is telling us that actually the whole purpose of the Vedas is to know Krishna. By all the Vedas, I am to be known. So the purport of the Vedic scriptures is to know Krishna. We want to know Krishna. What should we know? Well, we should... Janma karma chame divyam eva myo vetita. Right? We should know Krishna's janma and karma. We should know about Krishna's birth and activities. And we should understand how they're divyam, transcendental. So, like this, 
it, it's compared to the the clouds, which oh well, well the sky is free of clouds and filled with clearly visible stars. So this is the nature of autumn. In the night, there's, you don't have to worry about the clouds blocking the moonlight and the stars, because the clouds are all clear, they've gone away, there's no clouds in the, in the autumn season. You've got the clear sky, and the, the clear sky is like the Shabda Brahman, or the, it's like the mode of goodness, the pure mode of goodness, the clear sky with clearly visible stars. And the stars are like the, the different yoga processes. So the autumn sky shone brilliantly, just like the spiritual consciousness of one who has directly experienced the purport of the Vedic scriptures. So we want to direct experience of the, the purport of the Vedic. Direct experience means that we actually feel, we can understand the, the, the power of Krishna consciousness. We will feel transcendentally enlivened. Prabhupada had one servant. Uh, he was, it happened at the time of the moon landing, when the Americans were supposed to be landing on the moon. So Prabhupada had this one young man, an American man, and the, the American man was very infatuated with the moon landing. He was saying to Prabhupada, isn't it wonderful, Prabhupada, landing on the moon? And Prabhupada would just say, that's not the moon. Don't be, he said, this is not the moon. Don't be fooled. He said, this cannot be the moon. The moon is a, a higher planet. This is just a desert. The moon is not like that. So Prabhupada was telling him, and the man was very disturbed. He became very depressed. And he became very morose even. And Prabhupada could see that how the man was affected. And Prabhupada said to the young man, he said, you cannot be in Krishna consciousness if you are morose. Right? We know Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma. So one who has actually understood that he's Brahman, he will be Prasan he will be Prasanatma, he will be a joyful soul. So there should be that realization, direct experience of the purport of the Vedic scriptures. Knowing Krishna, we should feel ourselves to be very fortunate. We should feel very grateful for this opportunity to have a connection to Krishna. So that appreciation should be there. If we're not appreciating that, if we're not appreciating Krishna, it would be very difficult to continue our practice in spiritual life. We have to be getting some taste. And that taste, that is the experience of the purports of the Vedic scriptures. We have to get that taste. It has to be uh, uh, the proper feeling, the proper mood of Krishna consciousness. And pro this is mentioned in the purport. The spiritual nature is always brilliant, clean and blissful. And this spiritual nature, called Vaikuntha, immediately satisfies all the desires of the soul. This is the secret of Krishna Consciousness. Right? What's the secret of Krishna Consciousness? Satisfying the spiritual master. Soul. Satisfying the soul. Yes. So success is in satisfying the spiritual master. Okay. Yes, you have to get the help of the spiritual master who will guide you how to satisfy the soul, how to awaken the soul, the desire of the soul, satisfy all the desires of the soul. Okay. What is the desire? What are the desires of the soul? What does the soul actually desire? Conscious. Yes. Krishna. The love of Krishna. Yes, we want love of Krishna, Krishna consciousness. Yes, we want unlimited happiness. Yeah, we want un un yeah, we like that. Unlimited. 
engaging his constitution position. Yes, we want him to be connected to Krishna. Yes, yes. Yes. So they talk about this is uh, the spiritual nature called Vaikuntha, meaning no anxiety. If we're in anxiety, then that's not right. We should be free of anxiety. It's, of course, it's easy to get anxiety. It, it, it's not so easy to just transcend all these anxieties of the material world. I'm sure when you're running a centre and you look after devotees, different problems, devotees come up from day to day. And so there's always, you get anxieties. It's so difficult sometimes. Uh, and of course, when you have a family, the same things are there too. And th there will be anxieties, different problems come, maybe even health problems, whatever, problems with our own bodies, causing us anxiety. And sometimes it's difficult to transcend all of these things. And we have to, therefore, constantly check ourselves, and we have to go back to the basics, the sadhana, again, hearing and chanting. We have to have that very regular spiritual practice. Every day you want to have that program, you know, where you're doing a, a good sadhana, regular practice of hearing and chanting. And that will keep us away from all the anxiety, all the problems which come up in the course of everyday life. Otherwise, it can be very difficult, right? You agree? Even though we may be living in the temple, we may be full-time brahmachari, like that, but still you can have anxieties, right, Srinivas? Isn't that true? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah, we get anxiety. No, to, to stay free of all these things is not so easy. We have to... More than the householders. <laughs> Everyone has their share according to their karma. You can, it's, not, it's not always like that, but sometimes it is. It's going to depend on every individual who will be different for individuals. But we have to relieve ourselves, we have to get relief from the anxiety by taking shelter of the Holy Name and by doing proper study of the scriptures and the association of devotees and regular kirtan like that will help us to, to tolerate these things, right? Yes. The examples are given like a, just like rivers flow into the sea, but the ocean remains still, remains undisturbed. And so in the same way, the transcendentalist, his mind, even though so many thoughts, so many desires are there, can remain always controlled and peaceful. We have to apply the knowledge of Krishna consciousness. We cannot just be mechanical about these things. We want to experience the spiritual nature. It sounds attractive. So we can see the comparison, the autumn, autumn is clear and the stars are visible in the sky. So it's like the pure heart of the devotee. We saw Srila Prabhupada and in the end of his life, uh, his godbrothers came to visit him in Vrindavan. The godbrothers came to see him and Prabhupada asked them all, he said, uh, if I've committed offences against you, please forgive me. And Prabhupada could understand his health was not very good and he wouldn't remain in the world much longer. So he asked the devotees that, he said, uh, he said, I preached very strongly. He said, sometimes I was very outspoken. So he said, if I've offended you, please forgive me. 
and the, the, his god brothers were very nice about it, and they said, "No, no, you were, you've done very well. You did wonderful preaching. You didn't offend us. We are, we appreciate everything you've done. You did so much to push on Krishna consciousness." Anyway, that example was there that before he left the world, Prabhupada wanted to be relieved of any kind of. Uh, maybe a uh, grudge or bad feelings which might have been there. And that was also shown, I remember, when His Holiness Bhakti Tirthar Swami left the world. When Bhakti Tirthar Swami, you know, he was suffering from cancer for some time. So he had cancer and he, but he took the opportunity, you know, and he was telling, telling the devotees also, he said, when it comes time to leave the body, he said, you want to make sure that you get rid of any bad feelings or any grudges, anything you might have towards others. You don't want to take these kind of things with you to the next life. Sometimes people, they have a habit, they carry, we carry these things in our mind. We carry these different impressions with us, you know, we, we, oh, that person, I hate that person. And, Oh, I remember they did this to me and, you know, we have these feelings and we can carry them with us for a long time. And so it's very harmful for us, for our spiritual progress. It's really important that we're able to let go of all of these things. We have to clean the consciousness. We have to clean, as we say, clean the heart. Of course, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also spoke about this. When he said, Cheto Darpana Marjanam. And we have the example how Lord Chaitanya cleaned the Gundicha temple. And the Gundicha is the heart. And though we read about these things, we don't often understand that we're meant to do it ourselves to our own heart. We're meant to clean out our own heart and to get rid of all the bitterness and the, the grudges and the faults and offences which we've done. And so many different things are there, different anattas, yeah? kuti nati, mm. well, like fault finding and uh, ahimsa, viol and being violent to others and so on. So we have to, we want to be very conscious of these things. And that consciousness should be there throughout our life. You don't just want to wait till the end of life because we don't know when the life is going to end. We don't know how long we have left in this world. Just as Sukadeva, uh, uh, Maharaj Parikshit was, ask, was asking Sukadeva Goswami, what is the duty of one who is about to die and what is the duty of all men at all time? Because everyone's in this position, we don't know. Uh, we're, we're very insecure. At any time we may have to leave this world. And we should be ready. And so it's important for us to try to keep the heart as clean as possible. And don't get emotional, don't get bad feelings and hold on to a lot of bitterness and grudges and so on in our heart. Get them out, let them out and beg forgiveness from the people and try to keep a good relationship. And it's very important. And Prabhupada showed that, you know, the, the final pastime, as I said, when Prabhupada came, they all came, Prabhupada begged them. And they did, they, they said, yes, and no problem. We, we're, if we don't have any grudge against you, we, we don't feel you've offended us, we are appreciating you. So it was very nice. So this is important though, to clean the heart. And this is how the, the heart of the devotee should be, should be pure heart, we should be pure hearted. Yeah? Any comments? Okay, maybe we'll take a break now. All right, we'll take a break for 10 minutes and we'll be back. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 
Okay. Okay, so we're up to text number 44 here. We heard about the rainy season, we, then we heard about autumn, and we heard how Krishna and Balaram enter into Vrindavan forest, the beauty of Vrindavan. So here again, further glorification of Lord Krishna, text 44. The full moon shone in the sky, surrounded by stars. Just as Sri Krishna, the lord of the Yadu dynasty, shone brilliantly on the earth, surrounded by all the Vrishnis. Purport, Srila Sanatana Goswami explains that in Vrindavan, the full moon is eternally risen, and this full moon is like the full manifestation of the Absolute Truth, Sri Krishna. When he was manifest on earth, Lord Krishna was surrounded by prominent members of the Vrishni dynasty, such as Nanda, Upananda, Vasudeva and Akrura. Okay, so, uh, why, why do you think we would consider the the full moon to be so much relevant to Lord Krishna. What's the connection there between Krishna and the moon? Krishna appeared in the moon dynasty. Yes, right. And Krishna appeared on what day? The eighth day, right? Krishna asked me. It's the eighth day. So, was the moon full? Going towards being full. <laughs> Interesting answer. <laughs> Someone else? Was the moon full? Yes. Uh, no, I mean Krishna is appearing. What is the need for the full moon? <laughs> it's poetic. Mm. You know, so I can say something. Yes. Moon is usually gives a lot of bliss to everybody who's inside, and also it gives pleasure to everybody whoever fights it. Naturally, it is uh, very cooling and also it's useful uh, like a medicinal power to all the plants and other things. So, it, considering this, actually, Yadukula has been experiencing his presence uh, by relieving from the... Actually, later on, of course, the demonic people like Kamsa and others. Yes, right. Is, isn't the moon also related to the mind? Yes, yes, yes my friends. So, we do learn that on the, on the actual day of Krishna's birth, the moon was full, although it was astomy, the moon was full. And we're told the reason why the moon was full was, of course, because Lord Krishna is taking birth in the dynasty coming from the moon, whereas previously Lord Rama was born in the dynasty from the sun god. And so, the, the moon was very happy that Lord Krishna was appearing in the Yadu dynasty, and the Yadus, they come from the moon. So that was one reason why the moon was so happy. Uh, Maharaj, there's another, I mean, as far as I have heard, uh, the moon is actually more related to beauty. It's like, compared to beauty, it's like when you say moon-faced. So oh, like, oh. It's not say sun-faced, actually, it's said moon-faced. Uh -huh. So, because Krishna being, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the abode of all beauty, so it, uh, I mean, it's compared to moon, whereas sun, it, it represents power or valor or, or strength in that sense. 
so the teja basically so i mean that is uh, another aspect oh yes an interesting aspect yes the moon is considered beautiful we often uh, chandramukhi is <laughs> right the name a name for devotees we, Yes, like please. that, the, the beauty. Radharani also. Radharani? Really? Uh, well, she's also coming from the moon? No, no, compared, Maharaj. I'm not saying. Oh, face compared. like the moon, yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, here we, and just looking at Prabhupada's purport on the light of the Bhagwat there. Uh, Wait, I'll have to change it so you can see, yeah? Like the little bag one. You can see it, Maharaj. You can see it? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, this is like the bag one. You can see it now, right? Okay, the beautiful moon. On, on the day, the, the clear sky of autumn, the beautiful moon among the beautiful stars becomes the sinusure of all eyes just as lord krishna is the central attraction in the vrishni dynasty or the family of yadu so again yeah as prabhu but as prabhu mentioned about the beauty there an important point the the, the most beautiful time of the year the sarat moon right we say the moon and the sun, when the moon for the full moon and the sarat purnima lord krishna dances rasa Leela on that particular night it's the most beautiful time of the year in the most beautiful place in vrindavan on, on, so the lord krishna chose the most beautiful place to enjoy because he's the supreme enjoyer so the appearance and the disappearance, and then Prabhupada in the purport to this, uh, he, he talks about the appearance and the disappearance of the Lord. And how do we compare Krishna's appearance and disappearance? We, it's not to the moon, but rather we talk about what? Rising and setting of sun. The sun. Yeah, right. right. We're going to talk about the sun. Not just it's not the moon, but it's the sun which rises and sets, right? It's an interesting Prabhupada explains some nice points about that. He said the sun is first seen on the eastern horizon. But that does not mean that the sun is the is the sun of that site. <laughs> the sun is fixed in its own orbit and it neither rises or sets. It appears to be rising and setting, but because we first see it on the eastern horizon, we may say that the sun rises on that site. Similarly, the appearance of Godhead in some particular family does not mean that he is limited by obligations to that family. He is fully independent and may appear and disappear anywhere and everywhere because he is all pervading <laughs> so this is the, the nature of lord krishna his inconceivable potencies that he's all pervading he's not only um, uh, all pervading he's omniscient he's omnipresent and he's omniscient now, he knows everything and he, he can see everything so Prabhupada is telling us he doesn't just belong to that family. Although he appeared in that family, it doesn't mean that he's the property of that family. Just because he appears in the, we say the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Prabhupada says it's not true. The sun's in its own orbit, but it appears that the sun is rising. It appears that the sun is setting. Actually, it's due to us. We see we think the sun is rising and setting but the sun is just fixed in its own orbit so less intelligent persons cannot accommodate the appearance and disappearance of the lord as an incarnation but there is no sound reasoning to support such unbelievers 
And it's very difficult for people to understand how Lord Krishna appears and disappears. We know this is a very difficult point to try to present to people. People often tell us, oh no, Krishna died, and oh Krishna, how could he take birth like this? How, how can this be possible? They have great difficulty to understand these things. But Prabhupada said, if God is all-pervading, like the power of electricity, he can manifest himself at any place within the creation. When he is within, we cannot see him. But when he is without, he is seen by everyone, although very few know him as he is. Everyone sees the sun every day, but that does not mean that everyone knows what the sun actually is. I thought that was a very powerful point, that we see the sun every day, but it doesn't mean we know anything about the sun. We like to see it, and we need it so much, but we don't know anything really about the sun. In the same way, when Lord Sri Krishna was present 5,000 years ago, very few could know what he was. So this is the position of Lord Krishna. Very few people could know about Lord Krishna. So, so many people saw him, but not every, they could not understand that he is the Supreme Lord. Some few people, but not many. So very nice uh, examples there. I thought very useful for preaching that we see the sun every day. doesn't mean we know anything about the sun. And the same way Lord Krishna appears, doesn't mean you know anything about Krishna. Not everyone could understand who is Krishna. And because he appears in the Yadu dynasty, doesn't mean he's the property of the Yadu dynasty. Just like the sun rises, we say the sun rises in the east, but it doesn't mean it's, the sun is belonging to the east. So these are some in interesting points to be understood. Are you able to see the Bhagavatam now? No, Maharaj, this is light of Bhagavatam. Light of Bhagavatam, okay. I have to change it again, okay. No, no, Maharaj, we can see the Bhagavatam. Really? Yeah, yeah, it just came. Now we can see, Maharaj. Yes. This right. is it. Right, now you got it, right. Okay, so the full moon shone in the sky, surrounded by stars, just as Lord Krishna shone brilliantly on the earth, surrounded by all the Vrishnis. So the Vrishnis, they were also special people. They had all come to take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes. And these great devotees like Vasudeva and Akrura and Nanda, Upananda, you know, they're not ordinary souls. They're all special special devotees have a very intimate connection with Lord Krishna. Okay, going ahead, text number 45. Except for the gopis whose hearts had been stolen by Krishna, the people could forget their suffering by embracing the wind coming from the flower-filled forest. This wind was neither hot nor cold. Now, why, would, why, do, why does he say except for the gopis? Why could they not? Why could they not? Why were they suffering? Why could they not forget their suffering? The people were suffering. The people could forget their suffering by embracing the wind coming from the, the flower-filled forest. So it must have been a fragrance coming from the forest, so very pleasing. The wind was neither hot nor cold, but the gopis, they're still, their hearts are affected. Their hearts have been stolen by Krishna. So, what's the problem? They're not able to forget Krishna. They're not able to forget Krishna, yes. Why not? The wind, that wind which is coming, carries the fragrance 
from the forest and coming from the forest with the fragrance of the flowers. It reminds them of Krishna and their pastimes with Krishna in the forest. So when they when that wind comes, they, they feel that that wind is reminding them about huh? So the the wind is uh, it's like the impetus to the gopis remembering Krishna because it reminds them about their pastimes with Krishna in the forest. We'll see Prabhupada's uh, commentary on that also in the light of the Bhagavad. Uh, Prabhupada talks about he said there are two kinds of transcendental feelings in the worship of Krishna. Oh, this is where he talks about the Samboga and the Viraha. So feeling the separation from Krishna. The example of the gopis, mundane love. In the absence of Lord Krishna, the devotees associate with him by remembering his separation. And when we remember him in separation, that is more relishable than directly contacting him. It's more relishable to worship the Lord in separation. That is why the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all the followers, like the Goswamis, and they all worship Krishna in that mood of separation. In the mood of the gopis, service and vipralamba seva, service and separation. And by f serving in that mood of separation, we can feel the presence of Lord Krishna. And we have to cultivate that mood. We should, we should be anxious to see Krishna. At the same time, while we're cultivating the mood of separation, at the same time we want to keep that anxiety that when will Krishna come? When will we see Krishna? That should be the mood. That when, when will I get that opportunity to actually see Krishna? Okay, going ahead, 46. By the influence of the autumn season, all the cows, doe, women and female birds became fertile and were followed by their respective mates in search of sexual enjoyment, just as activities performed for the service of the Supreme Lord are automatically followed by all beneficial results. So just to, uh, you, you do activities for the service of Krishna, you get results. So the example is given here. <laughs> the autumn season, we know the, uh, here living here in Mayapur, we see <laughs> in the autumn season you can hear the birds cooing, and the cows, and uh, so many things. They're all they're all in that mood that they're fertile. And they want to produce their offspring. They want to have they have their mates, and they will try to make their nests everywhere. So the, the result, of course, is that they give birth. They have their children. They have their offspring. So in the same way, when we do service for Krishna, we'll get results. Service for Krishna will bring results, beneficial results. Right? What results will we get by serving Krishna? What's going to follow? Right? What was Go back to Godhead. Well, not right away. <laughs> could be starting with the uh, Gleshagni, Shubhada, and. Uh, um, progress further, you know, all the way to 
as we progress all the six chapters. Sri Krishna Krishna Chasa. Yeah, the, generally we give another example. There's a, an, another example. What, what actually comes about by devotional service? What's the result of devotional service? Attachment and uh, gyan. Yes. Love, love, love for Krishna. Yes, what's, what's the verse? Detachment. Vasudevya Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Hai Janayat Yashvairagyam Gyan Ucheta Yes. That's one verse, right? By the application of devotional service, one automatically acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Later on in Srimad Bhagavatam, there's an example about the hungry man who satisfies his hunger. Yes. yes. Do you know the translation? Just like a hungry man, when he takes food, three things happen. His uh, hunger goes away, uh, he gets satisfied, and then he gets nourishment. Same way when uh, we when we practice bhakti, then uh, we, we have the satisfaction of practicing bhakti, we get the experience of Krishna, and then we also get renunciation from the material world. Yes, good. Yes, three things come about. Direct perception of the Lord, and detachment from the material and also, what's the other thing? Detach. Oh. Detachment from the material, uh, direct perception of the Lord and? The, of the, the happiness of performing bhakti. Yes, the, the pleasure of doing bhakti, the happiness of devotional service. So this, this should be the result engaging in Krishna consciousness. And just like when these animals, is described here, these different animals, the cows, the doe, or the female birds and so on, they were in their fertile, and then their mates come, they, they're going to get pregnant, and they're going to get, they're going to give birth. They're going to give birth, so that's the result. So the same way, when we do devotional service, there will be a result, beneficial result. It has to be some change. Pe people say, I haven't changed. Sometimes people say, well, I haven't changed. I've been doing devotional service. I don't feel like I've changed. How do you reply to this, Srinivas? Someone's saying, I, I haven't changed, you know, I've been doing chanting Hare Krishna five years now, and I, I don't feel like I've changed. If we are chanting five years, means we have changed. We are attached to the direction of Mahamantra. We're attached to? Hare Krishna Mahamantra, five years chanting is not an easy thing. They must have changed. He must have changed. He is not realizing that. He must have changed. If it is not changed also, he has changed that he got attached to that Hare Krishna Mahamantra. That itself is a big change. And so the fact that he is still chanting after five years, that's a change, is it? He's he got attached with that holy name. He's become attached to the holy name. Uh -huh. Definitely there will be change. Uh -huh. Would someone else like to respond to this question? Maharaj, uh, one uh, other aspect why he is not getting uh, taste or why his feeling is not uh, improving, that is because of the offensive chanting. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's possible. Yeah, we say it like that, right? There's that verse in the second canto that uh, that heart is still framed that even after shedding tears uh, while chanting the holy name, he does not experience the change of heart. So there has to be the change of heart. That's the idea, right? The, the, when we talk about the beneficial results, it should really be the, in the, the change of heart. 
If, if, if the heart doesn't change, then our heart is still framed. In other words, as you say, offensive chanting. So the heart should change. We should etch. What, what should be that change the heart? We should be, well, there should be that awakening of different symptoms of Baba. They should, they, that, that. Shanti, Virakti, Abhyakta, Kalatum. Yes. What's the first one? Shanti. It's not just peace. In the Nectar of Devotion, Prabhupada is described, listed in different way. talks about... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think first he has listed the uh, listed uh, uh, not wasting time. Avyarta Kalatum. No, wasn't that? There's another one. It talks about forbearance. Yeah, that's Shanti. Tolerance, forbearance or tolerance. Shanti. That's the Shanti. That's what? That is that is Shanti. That is Shanti, is it? No, Shanti is not just peace. Shant no, 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 it's not just peace. That's also forbearance. Shanti means remaining undisturbed while there is cause of disturbance. Okay. So remaining undisturbed when there's cause for this. That's a, so this is a, the change of heart should come about with chanting, with devotional service. We should the come. Word, the the come. word used is Shanti, K-S-H-A-N-T-I, not S-H. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shanti. Shanti, Shanti, huh? Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Okay, I've got it now. I'm not so familiar with those <laughs> silent K's on the front there. But that's a, that's a, that should be the change in heart, the first thing which comes about, right? That kind of tolerance and forbearance in the difficult situations. That should be coming there in the course of our devotional service, the awakening of bhava. It should be coming. Oh. And that's also mentioned there later on in, the, in that same purport to the section. Mm. For he who patiently follows the regulative principles of devotional service, the time will come when he will relieve, when he will achieve the result as the wife's Will reap, will reap results by becoming pregnant. So people may, may come and they may say, you know, I feel uh, I've been following the devotional practice now for some time, but I'm, I, I don't feel a particular change in myself. But often we don't, we don't, we're not aware of the change, although there is a change. Prabhupada even gave an example about this. He gave the example about being in an aeroplane, which Prabhupada had taken aeroplanes around, you know, so many flights he took, and going around the world so many times. So Prabhupada saw you, you sit in the aeroplane, and one minute the plane's on the ground, but then after a few minutes, then the plane is up over, over the city, and you're looking down over the city. So Prabhupada saw that change. And he said, you don't feel anything, really. You, you know, you're in the airplane, you're just sitting there, but suddenly you're above, way up in the air, a thousand, a thousand feet up in the air. And so he said, devotional service is like that. You can be doing devotional service, and you may not feel that you've changed, but actually you have changed. And often we ourselves may not feel we've changed, but other people can see how you've changed. And even those who are not devotees, they can see how you've changed. They may not like it, how you've changed, but they can certainly see the difference, how you're changing. So for sure, you're chanting, you're following the program, there will be a change, and that change will, will be internal and external also, will come about. And as we mentioned, the external changes I mean we're not so attached to the material. 
we're more interested in Krishna consciousness. And internally, the purification, the false ego. We should become more tolerant and more generally more humble, like that. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Please, to Prabhu. Yes. When Mataji just now uh, quoted that uh, verse from first canto, uh, by, <clears throat> by performing devotional service to Vasudeva, and develops causeless knowledge and detachment, causeless knowledge and detachment. Swaj, I want to understand what is causeless in that. What's the meaning of causeless in that phrase, in that shloka? Well, causeless. You, the the knowledge, causeless knowledge means knowledge which is coming about without you actually really trying to acquire the knowledge. It's not just some kind of knowledge which you got from studying academic studies and reading and so on, taking a course and like that. It's knowledge which awakens. It comes, it's an awakening which comes about through the process of devotional service. So in that way, it's causeless. But Maharaj, don't we read ourselves uh, Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, uh, which evokes detachment anyway? Yes. Why is then causeless? Yes, we, of course, reading Srimad Bhagavatam and so on, but we're not just reading the Srimad Bhagavatam just to awaken detachment. We're, one, we're, we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam to become attached to Krishna. The focus is devotional service. The focus is not detachment. The detachment comes about on its own, automatically, causelessly. But the, the real focus of Srimad Bhagavatam is awakening our devotion for Krishna and our attachment to Krishna and our awareness of Lord Krishna as everything. Our, our intention is not to develop detachment or knowledge, but these things automatically follow where there is devotion. We read the Srimad Bhagavatam we, we should be reading anyway, in that mood, to develop our love for Krishna, to make us more conscious of Krishna. We want to know about Krishna. Not that I want to become detached and I want to, come, I want to become a scholar, I want to know things. No. But these things follow. Gyan and Vairag automatically follow where there is bhakti. Just like where the, print, where, the, where the king goes, then the, the ministers, all his entourage, they automatically follow. So where there is real devotion, there will automatically follow also knowledge and detachment. In that way, it is causeless. We're not endeavoring for that knowledge. We're not endeavoring for detachment. We don't want that. That will make the heart hard. We'll become proud. It's a cause of fall down. We're simply trying to develop a little devotion for Lord Krishna. We want the heart to become soft, not hard. But if we endeavoring for gyan, we get very hard-hearted, we get very renounced, again hard-hearted, we become proud, we become arrogant, we think we're very advanced, we think are very, I'm a great scholar, I know so many things, or I'm a great vairagi, I'm a great renunciate. No, that is not our goal at all. Our goal is to simply develop a little love for Krishna, devotion. And that's why our focus is hearing and chanting and remembering. Hmm? So it's an important point you brought up, Prabhu. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Yeah, thank you for that nice point. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 47. O King Parikshit, when the autumn sun rose, all the lotus flowers blossomed happily, 
except the night blooming Kumut, just as in the presence of a strong ruler, everyone, everyone becomes fearless except the thieves. So in the light of the Bhagavat, this flower, the night blooming Kamut, is explained. <laughs> right? It's a night blooming Kamut. So in the light of the sun, it doesn't bloom. The lotus flowers, they open in the sun. Sometimes where there's lotuses growing, you'll see people, they come in there in the morning and they get photographs and they take photographs and of the, the lotus opening. They have these nice cameras and they can photograph many pictures and you can see the lotus flower opening in the, as the sun comes up in the morning. But this flower, the komut, this is a, 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 like a lily. And it blooms in the night. Ku means bad and mut means happiness or pleasure. So this, <laughs> this, this flower is compared to the thieves because when there's a strong king, when there's a strong ruler, then the thieves are in trouble. They're, they're, no, they're, they're really in trouble. They've got to watch out because the king's really on top of things. <laughs> so Prabhupada, in his purport to hear this section on the light of the Bhagavad, he talks about how monarchy is really a much better system than democracy. And he describes how democracy, so many thieves and so many corrupt politicians, so he says it's much better. He said much better you have one king, then you only have to deal with one person if he becomes corrupt. But when you have politicians, you have a lot of people corrupt. It's very difficult to sort out everyone. But he said definitely monarchy is a much better system of government than democracy. So this is the example given here, the Kamuda, Kumud. They don't like the sun. So the thieves become fearful when there's a powerful ruler. Who was a powerful ruler? Who ruled? Who did the thieves fear? Did, did you read it? Who? Pritu Maharaj. Pritu Maharaj, yes, right. Prabhupada also writes, he said somewhere, it was in Kashmir, not, long, not that long ago, and they said the king there, they used to, if they caught a thief, they would cut off his arm. Sometimes like that. Yeah, Prabhupada wrote that. Hmm? Yeah, he wrote it somewhere. That's there. Yes. Even not that long ago, I know, in, I think it was Ethiopia, somewhere over in Africa, they had thieves like that, people stealing cars. One, one man, he had, he had to have his leg cut off. The other man had an arm cut off. They did that to thieves. And this way, uh, they, they don't get so much of a problem with thieves when they're very strict, when the ruler is very severe. So then it, uh, there's less chance of crime happening. So people were more careful. They said, even if you lost money, people would, would return it to you. Nobody would take it. If you lost it, people, people would return it to you. Please, please turn your mic off, Prabhu, when you're talking. So monarchy is a good system of government. That's the point, that you have a good ruler. You have somebody in charge, rather than committee. We have problems even with temples nowadays. It's difficult to get somebody, a temple president. Sometimes instead of a temple president, they just have a committee, and the committee decides everything. You don't have any one temp, You don't have any one person who's a temple president. Nobody wants to take the responsibility because it's so difficult to deal with everything and uh, deal with people. Sometimes it's like that, difficult to get 
the temple organized. And they prefer to put a, a committee, let the, all the, let, make a committee, and the committee decides everything. But it's better one person. Monarchy. <laughs> Okay, text 48. In all the towns and villages, people held great festivals, performing the Vedic fire sacrifice for honoring and tasting the first grains of the new harvest, along with similar celebrations that followed local custom and tradition. Thus the earth, rich with newly grown grain, and especially beautified by the presence of Krishna and Balaram, shone beautifully as an expansion of the Supreme Lord. So this is talking about the festivals uh, and in appreciation to the gifts of nature. And uh, when, when people do their harvesting, they harvest all the grains, so then they respect that these grains are the grace of God. They're produced by the, gift, the gifts of nature, and they have a festival, and they, they offer it. It's called the Navana, huh? Navana. Navanna. Navanna. Yeah. Navanna. Ah. So Navana, so that's the, the festival where they offer all the, the, the grains, the new grains, and Prabhupada writes that they'll prepare sweet rice and they will distribute it to everyone and everyone will be happy to accept the grains and taste them. So the ceremony, the Navana, this ceremony is a, actually to worship the Supreme Lord and to thank Him that He is, by His grace, we've been able to produce these grains. And so this is the system of yagya or sacrifice, which is very important in the world. But, but again, it's forgotten about. The world has become so materialistic. Instead of worshipping the Lord, People were just simply putting fertilizers and chemicals and insecticides and so many things like that. They're, going, they're doing everything to destroy nature. You have genetically modified grains and everything is just so corrupted and destroyed. The beauty of nature is gone. This is an unfortunate condition in the Kali Yuga. So these religious ceremonies are practically forgotten about. But still they have, uh, Prabhupada mentions here, said the greatest of all such ceremonies, Durga Puja. So Durga Puja, of course, a very, very big festival in Bengal. It's very important for people. Even... Uh, I was reading that uh, one of the reasons why Modi's party could never do very well in Bengal was because they, they, didn't, they didn't speak enough about Durga Puja. <laughs> they didn't glorify enough Mother Durga. Bengali people very much appreciate Durga Puja is very important. And Prabhupada mentions it here is uh, the greatest of all such ceremonies. And so Durga Puja was meant for this actually. Of course now it's very different. Now it's people just forget about the grains and so on. It's some other thing is there will be alcohol and there'll be killing of goats and things like that. Everything become degraded. So the influence of Kali Yuga is very strong. We have to preach, we have to establish what should be actually done. What is the real position? What is the real duty?
by the Krish by the help of the Krishna consciousness movement, we're seeing now that couples are becoming more aware of the need to perform some scars in bringing up their children. They like so much to to do some scars for their children. Anaprasna, of course, is very popular. The first grain. And there, there are other samskars, which some should be done before the birth, like the Garbhajan samskar at the time of conception, and then with the birth of the child, then there's samskars, and then there's one when the child begins education, begins writing, going to school, and it's another samskar. So these samskars are being reintroduced with the help of the Krishna consciousness movement. So we encourage these festivals, and these festivals, religious festivals, are very important. But religious festivals, have, they've become also very degraded. As I said, alcohol, meat eating, and so many things. We want to show people what is actually the, the pure way to chant the holy names of the Lord, chanting and dancing and distribution of prasada, nice vegetarian prasada. So these things are very important. So that's the real festival. When you have a festival like that, chanting the holy name and distributing prasadam. Okay, then text 49, which is the last text of the chapter. The merchants, sages, kings and brahmachari students kept in by the rain were at last free to go out and attain their desired objects. Just as those who achieve perfection in this life can, when the proper time comes, leave the material body and attain their respective forms. Wow! Are we looking forward to that? Leave the material body and attain their respective forms. So Prabhupada discusses about being free to, go, to get out. Of course, in the rainy season, I don't know, were you able to do much in Jarakanda, Srinivas Prabhu? In the rainy season, you could do much, you could go out much? Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Everything goes on just the same in the rainy season. Do you have land there? Hare Krishna? Srinivas Prabhu? Hare Krishna? Maharaj, I think uh, his internet is off or something. You know, his see. internet's not so good, huh? He's, he's no more connected, Maharaj. Okay. All right, maybe one of you would like to take up this question. Were you affected by the rain? When the rainy season comes, does it restrict your activities? Yes, Maharaj, obviously. We are not able to go out, we are not able to perform regular preaching activities. Of course, we try to do whatever we can, but uh, definitely we are restricted by heavy rains. Usually, what, you mean go, you go outside on what, not Nagar Sankirtan or something? Go for college preaching, we go for um, congregational preaching, we invite our, we invite devotees, so what happens is the number reduces during uh, rainy season, people do not come out. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, right. Yeah. right. The rains can be quite severe and makes the transportation hazardous. So people won't come out much. In big cities, generally, it doesn't affect much. Or for all other things, what we have seen, people continue to go to their office, to schools, colleges, everywhere. But when it comes to coming to temple, then it uh, rain becomes an hindrance for them. 
Yeah, everything else goes on, but the yes, temple yes. can be forgotten about. <laughs> mm, interesting. Uh, Maharaj, yes. Uh, some sometimes in big cities also like we see. I mean, it is not a regular phenomenon, but sometimes extreme rain can be a problem even in the big cities because big cities, Indian big cities means like they have no conception of uh, you know uh, uh, drainage system. Our drainage system is pathetic, so that's why even if it's rain a little more than what is expected, you can see like a flood-like situations. So, yeah, it's true that uh, rain becomes an alibi for many, uh, like, Kacha devotees not to come. But in some cases, we have seen, just like in Mumbai, we, many times we see there are flood-like situations in the city, yes, which is yes. inconceivable, but, I mean, thanks to the drainage system. Well, yes, of course, it's a, it's a great challenge because the rain can be so severe. It can be so much rain in a very short time. You get so much heavy, heavy rain. Very difficult to have the proper drainage system for so much, for some, such heavy rainfall. I can, I'm sympathetic to the government that it's a real challenge <laughs> to try to do something about the, the drainage there in the city. Maharaj, our good friend Srinivas Gopal is back. Oh, okay. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Srinivas? Not disconnected, Maharaj. Yes. I wanted to know, are you affected much by the rain there? Not so much, Maharaj. It was not so much affected. <coughs> You can still go out and go on with everything. Yes. Okay. But of course, the rainy season, the colleges are closed. It is like since two years, colleges are not open. Since two <laughs> years. Corona. Two years have closed, huh? Is it all online? Yeah, yes, Mother. Oh. Online and weekly program, they come here. Okay. All right. Anyway, the 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 the, the point in this uh, analogy is that with the rain over, then people can go out and they can go back to their duties. I mean, we hope when the COVID is over, then things will may come back to normal. I I don't know when will happen when the COVID would go over. I mean, two years ago we thought, well, this should be over soon, but it seems to be going on. It doesn't seem to be ending. That's a now there's a new variant also just came out and that's worrying people everywhere. And so we don't know how long this uh, this is going to go on, how, how much restriction is going to be there. The, some restrictions are lessening but still there's a lot of restriction in travelling around anywhere. It becomes very difficult. Anyway, talking about the rain here in this example, it said in the same way that uh, people, that, that they can, when the proper time comes, they can leave the material body and obtain their respective forms. So Prabhupada talks about how people have different goals. He said, not everybody's the same. He said, in the, he said, in the case of the transcendentalist, be he a jnani, a yogi, or a devotee, because of the material body, he cannot actually enjoy spiritual achievement. So this is one point Prabhupada's making. Because we have a material body, it's very difficult for us to actually enjoy any spiritual achievement. But as soon as he gives up the body, or after death, then... Well, the jnani merges with the impersonal Brahman and the yogi goes to the higher planets and the devotee can go back to Godhead, we hope. But it's an interesting point Prabhupada makes, that so long as we have a material body, we cannot actually enjoy spiritual achievement. The material body, certainly, we know the miseries of the material body. 
And Prabhupada also, Srila Prabhupada, although he was a transcendentalist, he also suffered the different convenience, inconveniences of the body. Prabhupada would get sometimes headaches, and sometimes fever, like that. The material body, certainly with age, there's going to be problems with the body, more disease comes. So even though you may be quite an advanced spiritualist, you cannot actually fully develop the spiritual nature of life due to the material body. You have to give up that body. You have to leave it behind. So that, of course, this is something we all have to face. We have to prepare ourselves for that, giving up the material body so that we can actually go back to, we can continue our devotional service. Ideally, we don't want to take another body. We want to finish this business of birth and death. But that's difficult also. Jiva Goswami mentions that a, de that a devotee would not immediately go back to Godhead, but he would take birth where Lord Krishna is performing his pastimes and take part in Lord Krishna's pastimes before going back to Godhead. In other words, more training is required. Now some people feel quite disturbed and disappointed when they hear this. But I, I don't personally see a, a big problem. I think, it, well, you're already back to Godhead if you're there with Krishna. If you're going to be there with Krishna and can take part in Krishna's pastimes, that's so wonderful. What more could you want? Certain, certainly we don't want to go to higher planets. We don't want just yoga powers. We don't want impersonal liberation. What we do want is the association of Lord Krishna. So whether we get the association of Lord Krishna here on this, in this world, the material world, or in the spiritual world, is there a difference? I don't see a big difference. If you're getting the opportunity to be with Krishna wherever it is, that's good. That's very nice. It's a chance for the perfection of our life. Everyone agree? Maharaj. But we don't know who the spiritual world is, so we cannot. I cannot, I cannot say that there's <laughs> any difference is there or not. Well, we do know how the spiritual world is. We do know Krishna showed the spiritual world to the to all the coward men. And he showed them Goloka Vrindavan. They were surprised. They said, "Well, it just looks like Vrindavan. It just looked like Vrindavan to them." He said, "Yes, he said, it's a spiritual world." It's just like, you know, Goloka and Gokula, they're not so different. You know, they're both the spiritual world. But one is eternal and one is temporary. One's a temporary manifestation within the material world and the other is eternal. But it's not so different. Vrindavan, we're hearing about it. We're hearing about Vrindavan. Chintamani, and prakara, you know, the, the desire fulfilling trees and kamadenu cows and, and the dust is chintamani and kalpabriksha everywhere. And every, every word is a song and every step is a dance. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's devotee, everyone's madly in love with Krishna. And Krishna is the center of everyone's life. Everyone's fully Krishna conscious. They're all pure devotees. How can you say you don't know what Vrindavan's going to, you don't know what the spiritual world's like? We do know. It's described. Described. Vaikuntha, we read about Jain Vijay, uh, the four Kumaras going into the spiritual world. There's very elaborate descriptions here about the spiritual world, Vaikuntha. We do know. We heard Maharaj, but we have not experienced. No? Well, that's your chance. 
When we give up the body, we get the chance to experience it. We'll... Question. Yes. Maharaj, you were saying that we, will, we have to take part, take, take, take birth and uh, uh, we have to be like associate of Lord Krishna and then we will go back to Godhead. Yes. But already this holy name is non different from Krishna. So this is not a pastime, like we are taking part in that. Yes, the holy name is not non different from Krishna, but. That's only one part of Krishna, right? We, we, we want to experience the fullness of Krishna, all his different potencies. The chanting of the holy name, that's given to us by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he's come to teach us the importance of Sankirtan. So yes, we can be chanting the holy name, but there will be qualities in our chanting. If we're chanting the pure holy name, then that's very good. If you're, if you're chanting the Shuddhanam, then you're back to Godhead. You're already back to Godhead. Because the Shuddhanam is there. And so, if you're, if your chanting is so powerful that you're able to chant Shuddhanam, you don't have any problem. You don't have anything to worry about. You're already back to Godhead. You're already with Krishna. However, most of us were trying to chant Nama Bas. We're trying to come to the, the, the level of Na Nama Bas brings us to the liberated platform. Well, we have to go on from there. And we have to develop our love for the holy name, the taste for the holy name. We have to develop that desire to be with Krishna and to see Krishna. So we were saying, feel that we have to feel the separation from Krishna. So when we're chanting, we have to chant the name in separation. What was the example Prabhupada gave about chanting? How, what should be the mood? Child crying for mother. Child crying for mother. Yes. Genuine, genuine cry of the child for the mother. Right, right. Like the child separated from the mother. <clears throat> So we're separated from Krishna. So when we chant like that, we should be feeling the separation from Krishna. Of course, the chanting of the holy name helps to relieve us from that fire of separation. But still, we want, to, we want Krishna. When will he come? Maharaj, can I ask a question? Please. Maharaj, generally we say that uh, devotional service is not dependent on any other process. Uh, but we see that as we were discussing about the chanting, when we think about the tenth offense deeply, it's actually dependent on detachment, Vairagya. Tenth offense is attachment to the conception of I and my. And we cannot chant the pure holy name, offenseless holy name, unless we have that detachment. So is it not bhakti some way dependent on detachment? Well, yes, there has to, you can't be too much attached, but you can't be too much detached also. There is a relevant verse in this matter. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I, I'll have to check that where I saw that verse. It's in eleventh canto. Man. Yeah, eleventh canto, right? Right, eleventh canto. There's eleventh canto talks about you shouldn't be too much, too much detached, or too much attached. So we shouldn't be too much either way. Right, Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, you know the verse. It's in the eleventh canto. Uh, it's, they speak like that about the qualification to take up devotional service. 
there just shouldn't be too much, too much, you can't be too much detached, that's not good. At the same time, you shouldn't be too much attached. So there has to be that <laughs> balance, you know, you have to be in between to get it right, to actually get in there, to get established in devotional service. There, you have to be rightly situated. Not too much, we shouldn't, too much detachment, we would just be hard-hearted, cold, and too much attached, then also we would be too much, too sensuous. So it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a challenge, becoming a devotee, we can see. It's, it's not so easy thing. The, what, what, what's required actually? Of course, we say, we say, oh, it's not so easy, but actually it is easy. It is easy. What we really have to do, we just have to chant the holy name and dance in the kirtan and take prasada. And, you know, it all comes about. It all starts to happen. You just... Cause, huh? cause the, you explain why it's causeless. Yeah, causeless. You know, it, it's, you, you, it's just like you, you get on the... You grab hold of it, you know, <laughs> and you just get pulled along. If you get in the right place, in the right group of people, in the right mood, then, you know, and you, you just take off. Just very quickly you can make advancement without even knowing about it, without even thinking about it. It can happen like that, very nicely. And, and sometimes people are surprised to see when somebody becomes a devotee that how quickly they can change that they can become so serious devotees in a very short time. It doesn't really have to take a long time at all. You just get in the, get in the mood with the other devotees and hold on to them and do as they're doing. You follow the program, do the program and everything. And it, and it just all happens. Krishna consciousness is there within us. It's all within us. It just has to be awakened. So this is what the Krishna Consciousness Movement is for, is for awakening that Krishna Consciousness within us. And the theory is there, some theory is there, okay. Don't be too, too attached, don't be too detached, you know, these things, yeah. Yes, Maharaj, I also feel to be a devotee is not, not easy. I'm realizing this. <laughs> yeah, we say, well, it's not easy, but at the same time, it is easy, you know? I, I'm, I'm saying it's not easy in some ways, but at the same time, actually, it is easy. It is easy. What's the difficulty? And Prabhupada would often say, what is the difficulty? Yes, what? Maharaj, uh, it's easy to uh, follow the program that Prabhupada has given. But it's finding difficult to enter that mood, um, the devotional mood. Like we chant, I chant, but there is no devotion. It's totally mechanical. Well, there must be some devotion there because you're doing it. You're not a machine. You're a person and you have feelings and you do it. You may do it, you may not do it lovingly, but you, but you do it. And so there's some love there. There must be some trace of love there. And that love will develop as you go on chanting. Thank you for your blessings, Maharaj. Oh, definitely. And Krishna is blessing all of us. He's given us this Krishna consciousness movement. He gave us the Bhagavad Gita. He gave us Srimad Bhagavatam. He sent Srila Prabhupada to all of us to preach to us. He's given us everything. Just hold on to Prabhupada's feet and Prabhupada will carry us back home, back to Godhead. All right, any other questions, any comments? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, may I ask a question? Please do. Hare Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask a question? Yes, please do, yes. Um, Maharaj, I was thinking about this point where Srila Prabhupada was asking forgiveness from his god-brothers 
and it was genuine it whatever he did was a very genuine act even though they all stopped him from uh, executing uh, they did not support him and sometimes even tried to stop him from executing his spiritual master's instruction uh, Prabhupada genuinely uh, said sorry to them and sometimes uh, I don't feel like saying some sorry to someone because I have some negative feeling or whatever is it okay to say a false apology because apologizing is the right thing to do well yes yes it's definitely the right thing to do you know <laughs> they have some they have some tension between people it's it's not good we we don't want to keep it you don't want to keep it there because it's going to be a weed and it's going to obstruct the growth of your bhakti creeper. So we do want to try to get rid of these things in the course of our spiritual practice. That you have some, we have some tension, we have some difficulties getting along with people. Uh, we, we, we do want to try to just remove them and open up and uh, don't let them, don't let this obstruct our relationship with Krishna. Because it, that's the important thing, that we have our relationship with Krishna. And if somehow, if we've got this thing in our mind about somebody else and like that, then it's going to obstruct, this is going to be the wheat to our devotion. So we do want to get rid of these things. And try to get rid of them as quick as possible as well. Uh, how to do it? Well, how to do it? Well, generally what we do do is just offer obeisances to the devotees, you know, please accept my humble obeisance. And if, we're, if we have difficulty to do that, then we give service to the devotees. Do service for them. Somehow find some way to serve them. Offer, bring serve prasadam to them. Give a flower darling to them, you know, and greet them with a smile, you know, that's important. Greet them ha happily, that we're happy to see them, not, oh, <laughs> you know, not that we, we, you know, we scrub our face, or oh, I don't know, they've come, you know, but we should open our hearts that, oh, so nice to see you, like that, you know, appreciating devotees is very important for us, you know. This is Kali Yuga. Kali means the age of quarrel. And this quarrel, we let Kali come into our midst and it obstructs our devotional creeper. So we have to keep Kali out. By no quarrels. Only loving relationships. So loving relationships, offering gifts in charity, accepting charitable gifts, offering prasada, accepting prasada. Revealing your mind in confidence and inquiring confidentially. Loving exchanges between one devotee and another. The basis of our Krishna consciousness movement. So we have to do these things. It's very helpful for us. So I'm appreciating these things more. I'm trying, to, I'm trying myself to work on myself by preaching to you about these things. I'm also trying to get myself also into these, to understand all these things, because it's very important. Anyway, thank you, Maharaji. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Any other comments? Yes. Can I comments, Maharaj? Yes. Maharaj, regarding Vaikuntu Dham, uh, Sri Nebhas Prabhu said that, you know, have experience to see Vaikuntha Dham. How we can see Vaikuntha Because we can hear from the Bhagavatam. By associating devotees, by hearing Bhagavatam, reading Bhagavatam, we can see the Vaikuntha Dham. Because in Vindavan, where Prabhupada, Prabhupada is, uh, is stayed in Krishna Balaram uh, temple, his house, his courtyard, there is one called Prabhiksha. In this Kalpa picture from that tree is still Radhari's name coming out, like uh, writing Srimati Radharani, Sri Radhe, Radhe Sham, Ram. So 
वृंदवन धाम चिंतामणि धाम मायपुर धाम चिंतामणि धाम ग्रेट रोड वन सॉन्ग दैट गौरव मंडल भूमि जेबा जाने चिंता भूमि तार है भूमि बास सो मायापुर एंड वृंदावन धाम बहुत आर चिंता मनी धाम ओनली प्योर डिवोटी कैन रियलाइज दैट धाम दे कैन सी द धाम बाय एसोसिएटिंग प्योर डिवोटीज प्योर पर्सनल्स व्हेन वी सिंग अ मंडियन सॉन्ग वी फील पेन इन आवर लीव्स बट व्हेन वी चैंट हरि कृष्ण महामंत्र वी नेवर फील पेन इन आवर लीव्स ओके वेरी नाइस थैंक यू प्रभु सो वेरी नाइस You're seeing Vrindavan. You're seeing Vaikuntha every day. Goloka. Now, now, Mahadas, we are associating Sadhu Sangha. We are getting your association. We are still in Vaikuntha Dham. Yes. Yeah. So Sadhu Sangha, we are getting every day. Right. Hari Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay, so. If there are no more questions. I'll meet you tomorrow. We'll continue on to chapter twenty-one tomorrow, the Venu Gita. So thank you very much, Shri Prabhupada Ki. Uh, Go back to Vrinda Ki. Uh, Hare Krishna.